This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. So I guess the evolution of Canberra Dining um, is a long way from where it was 15 years ago, but now you don't have to travel far at all to get a uh, world-class meal. So yes, it's been uh, awesome to be a part of um, and just seeing the, and the way the city's grown. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. We've talked a lot about the amazing culinary evolution going on in the nation's capital, and few have had the impact of today's guest. A stalwart of Canberra in some ways, but also part of the new throng of energy adding colour to the dining scene too. John Leverink is a co-owner of the Boathouse Restaurant and Canteen in Canberra. John, how are you? I'm well, thanks, mate. It's good to get you on the show. You're pretty busy with a couple of venues doing very different things. How's things like at the moment? Uh, pretty bu- pretty busy. I can uh, feel busier than than ever, but that's mostly due to the, the birth of my, my second child, second daughter, uh, just in a few weeks ago. What's what's um what's the scene like in Canberra at the moment? You've been a part of it for quite some time, but you know the the evolution's been fascinating as a diner. What's it been like for you? Um, I guess always try to keep um you know aware of what's going on around town, um, and I guess that becomes increasingly harder when venues get busier and time gets uh, shorter. But I mean the evolution from what it was even 15 years ago is pretty pretty dramatic to be honest but now you don't have to travel far at all to get a uh, world-class meal um, here in the capital um, you know previously you'd have to drive to, to Melbourne or Sydney um, you know to to experience something a little bit different but now now we've got you know a number of great great offerings um, so yes yeah, it's, it's been uh, awesome to be a part of. I mean, just seeing the the way the city's grown. Well, you've got two venues, you know, one that's, you know, you'd probably categorise as a stalwart of, of Canberra dining scene and a, and a kind of a new offering, which is so far removed from what you do in Canteen and based on Ramen Daddy. Um, what, what's it like having those two very different venues? I mean, it's awesome, actually. Um, it kind of gets, it gets the, the creative juices flowing. Um, Eddie, who's my partner at Canteen, used to be the head chef of the boathouse, so we were you know, really well together. Um, so I guess just, you know, bouncing ideas off each other before we open the restaurant, um, you know, with a modern Japanese, you know, French twist um, was, yeah, I mean, it was very refreshing and kind of um, kind of lent into the way the boathouse menu works with, you know, the fundamentals of French cookery with, um, I guess, the... The flavors of Japan dabbled throughout. Tell us, a, tell us a little bit about the offering at Canteen and sort of um, what you're doing there. Yeah, cool. So, um, Canteen or Ramen Daddy was born off the back of, of COVID. Um, it's just something we started, you know, playing around with in the kitchen, making our own noodles, playing with kansui. Um, then we just made, you know, um, stocks here and there out of out of our our waste in the kitchen for staffies and then what what turned into a more significant offering. Um, so canteen's a, a modern Japanese ramen sake bar. Um, and we only we only serve Japanese and Australian spirits, wines, um, everything in the venue itself is Japanese and, and Australian. 
as you mentioned, Raman Dutty sort of came out of COVID in a response to sort of a, a flight or fight sort of um, situation. It's a, it's a cracking ramen. We've had it a few times. Um, tell us a bit about it. What makes a great ramen like that? Um, well, a lot of passion. <laughs> it's a, it's a, um, Eddie, Eddie's the, the, the noodle and soup master. He um, takes a tremendous amount of pride in making the, the best noodle um, and and soup. So I guess it's just a balance of the, you know, of the salt and the uh, umami, um, and also the richness. So we do a tori patan, um, so a chicken only um, ramen. Um, so it's it's often hard to find the the gelatinous, um, you know, strain that that most people crave from a ramen. But um, with the the right equipment and the right techniques, you get a very I guess pure, pure style of ramen, um, and the feedback has been tremendous. The boathouse, uh, as we sort of mentioned, is a bit of a stalwart of the Canberra dining scene. Tell us a bit about sort of where it is and, and what you're doing there. Yeah, cool. So I guess yeah, the boathouse was opened in '93, so um, celebrating 30 years this year. Um, and I started here as a, a third year apprentice. Um, in 2001, so a considerable amount of time in the one kitchen. Um, but yeah, I've definitely seen seen the, the industry change as well as the styles. Um, you know, going from the classical French to the the, the molecular uh, back to you know the, the modern modern Australian as we see it now. Um, so it's been a, a brilliant journey. Uh, where do I see it going? I guess. Um, you know, it's probably just a more uh, focused approach on the quality of the, the food and not so much the technique anymore. Um, so just buying the best best available uh, seafood, best available meat, best available vegetables um, and just treating them with more respect than perhaps we would have 10 years ago, you know, not, not messing with what's already a really good product. Um, and I guess... We, you know, with the the trend of um, you know people eating healthier and more plant based um, diets, you know, trying to get the best out of our, our vegetables as well. I, I want to explore sort of your cooking and and the boathouse in more detail. But take us back to when you were young. You grew up in Canberra. What, what sort of role did food play in your family? Look, my, my father's Dutch and my mother's very Australian, so it was a, a kind of a mishmash of a um, food offering, I guess. It would have it could have been, you know, a lot of potato and a lot of cabbage and a lot of worst and a, a lot of sausages um, some nights and then, you know, just a chicken schnitty on other nights. So pretty pretty diverse um, food offering in, in the household when I was growing up. Um, and it wasn't until... I guess I, you know, started in kitchens that I, I started understanding that there was more to, um, than to food than crumbed, crumbed chicken and and potatoes. Tell us about uh, when you first started getting interested in food and what lured you to a career as a chef. Yeah, I guess um, um, I would have been pretty young because I started cooking when I was just under seventeen. Um. I was a kitchen hand in a hotel just out of a, an opportunistic kind of work experience program. Um, and I just kind of fell in, in love with the, well, first of all, I just fell in love with washing dishes, which is a bit weird. Um, it was just a, you know, you could see that things had a, an order and a place and a system. And I just kind of, that, that drew me to, um, the kitchen t- to begin with and there was you know a few chefs here and there that said um maybe you should think about becoming a chef and I, i'd always liked, liked cooking even when i was a kid um i'd often bake with mum cakes and things um and i don't remember a lot of these stories but there was a few times well one one time in particular where I'm, i made a chocolate cake and i must have been very young um and I put it out of the oven and, then, and we cooled it on a rack and then I served it to my mum and dad and when I tried it, um, it, was, it was horrendous. I couldn't eat it. And then 
And then I went and grabbed the plates back off my mum and dad and threw it in the bin. <laughs> Said you can't eat that. <laughs> um, so maybe that was the maybe that was the beginning. Take us into those kitchens, sort of when you first started your apprenticeship. Uh, you mentioned that you joined the boathouse, sort of in your third year. But what, where did you work before that? I uh, worked at a couple of um, hotels around around town, um, and they were a, an eye opening experience. Um, you know the way that hotels. I don't think it, it definitely wasn't. The, it was kind of maybe just after the hotels in the heyday. Um, with the likes of the Oak Room at the Hyatt in Canberra and the, um, when, you know, fringe benefits tax was not a thing and, um, and people dined for lunch and dinner around the capital. Um, so I probably, I probably got into food just after that. Um, and I guess, yeah, it was definitely an eye-opening experience, like the, the hierarchy of a brigade in a large kitchen um, the chef always seemed to be there, never went home. Um, you know, it was a, an inspirational time in my life. I mean, you're very young, you're very, you know, you're just a sponge really. Um, so I guess a lot of my working career was modeled off the few chefs that I worked with early on where just, you know, you're just, you're just there all the time. Who's been sort of early on in your career? Has there been anyone that sort of was quite influential on you and sort of your sort of beginnings as a chef? Yeah, I mean, um, Darren Tetley, who runs the the press club in Canberra now, um, we work extremely closely together for a good part of a decade. Um, and I guess he was the, the backbone of, of my career. Um, he taught me, you know, how to run a kitchen, how to achieve costs, um, how to get the best out of your staff, how to inspire people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, spent a lot of time with him and I guess he just saw saw it, something in me that perhaps I didn't see in myself at the time. Um, and then it just kind of grew from there. Tell us a little bit about joining the boathouse how did you sort of make the transition from you know the hotel chef and hotel life and into sort of a standalone venue like the boathouse yeah so i had to run some some really good friends of mine that were working in some other canberra uh, institution restaurants um, like the lobby um who he was you know finishing his apprenticeship and we were at tafe together um, and he was like, I think you should, you know, jump into a restaurant. Like um, the style's different, the brigade is different, um, the food is, you know, different. Um, you know, you won't have to do breakfast anymore. <laughs> um, so it was kind of like just a few of my peers that had said, um, you know, why don't you try and do a, a restaurant? And I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, it sounds great. Um, so I applied, applied for a job at the Bonehouse and... I guess the rest is history. Well, you've, you've been there for um, over two decades now and now you're co-owner. Um, what was it like when you first sort of started there? Do you have any stories of working in the kitchen and getting used to, you know, what they were doing at the boathouse? I mean, yeah, I guess it was a time, um, you know, when when French French cuisine was still with its, its height and popularity. Um, so I just remember a lot of, a lot of butter and a lot of a lot of jus making sauces constantly, um, which we still do, but probably not on the scale as we used to. Um, um, I remember, you know, setting a thousand bavoirs and um, making Paris breasts like <laughs> um, it was going out of fashion. Um, so I guess it was just a different different time. It was. Um, the brigade probably hasn't changed a lot in the way it's set up. The kitchen has changed a lot as in the way it's set up and how we operate. But um, um, I guess the the emphasis on quality and, and the experience, um, providing experience to everyone that walks through the door, um, hasn't changed. Working your way up through a, through a venue like you have to, you know, become co-owner, has it been some really key moments that you can tell us um, about your progression through the kitchen and sort of the impact it had on you? 
Yeah, it's funny. It's funny like when you say two decades. Um, it doesn't feel like I've been here that long. <laughs> if that makes it all <laughs> at all sense, like it, it, the job feels as fresh as it did on my first week. Um, the the boathouse is it's a beast of a restaurant. We do s- such a diverse range of dining options. Um, you know, we opened a bar at the back called Amada Bar in, in COVID times. Um, so we we added a bar offering. We do weddings. We do. You know, we do a lunch restaurant, we do a dinner restaurant, um, lots of events for corporate and personal private. Um, so the the weeks are, there's no week that's the same as the last. So I guess that's why I kind of fell in love with the role. Um, you know, you're always, always looking to do something different and new and exciting. Um, and so, yeah, when, you know, it doesn't feel like I've been here as long like the the scenery's changed slightly there's a few more buildings on the on the foreshore that we look at um but you know the the venue itself has changed a little bit but it still feels like you know i just started (laughs) but tell us tell us a little bit about finding your voice on the plate and your food and and that move into that sort of senior role um as it emerged with the with the restaurant yeah i guess um I guess I struggled a fair bit at the start of um, finding what what my you know what I wanted to put on a plate and how it was meaningful, um, and I guess that's just something that happens. I mean, it definitely happens to some people quicker, um, but I guess that you, you know you you've got so many ideas of what what you think is. Um, not always trendy, but what you think is delicious and tasty and, and what people want to eat. Um, and I guess it's a, you know, it's just experience and the time listening to people um, and the feedback and um, that kind of shapes the way you end up putting food on a plate. So I guess like I was saying before, the way we approach everything now is more produce-based um, cookery. Um Whereas I guess when when you're trying to find your style, you're you're open, much more open to, you know, trying more molecular or, or more classic or, um, and just kind of working out from there, what what your style is. You've uh, been involved with the boathouse for a long time now. What's what's the modern diner like in Canberra as compared to sort of ten, fifteen years ago? Is is the dining room a little bit different in the interactions compared to back then? Yeah, I guess it's a bit more casual. It's a bit more fun. You can have some banter with clients about their wine choices. Um, you know, we 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 still want to make it a fun experience. You don't want to like it's not as stuffy and and reserved um, as it was. Of past, um, you know, the boathouse is still very much a fine diner. Like we still have white linen and napery, and you know the rest of the the kit that goes with a fine dining restaurant. Um, the service has has definitely changed in the way that you know it's much more approachable, um, and you feel like you can have a conversation with a waiter about you know a particular wine or you know perhaps even the attractions around the Canberra region. Um, and I guess that goes for a lot of the venues around town. Like it's, um, I guess we're probably one of only few uh, fine dining restaurants left in, in the capital with a couple of recent closures and um, a few other venues that will probably perhaps close soon. Um, you know, there's not, not a great deal of um, our style offering left in the capital. The last couple of years have been incredibly challenging for many and particularly those in hospitality. Um, Ramen Daddy and Canteen were kind of born from COVID. What, what sort of impact has that period of time had on you and your approach to to your career? I mean, definitely definitely tells you, teaches you a lot about business. And um, I mean, it was obviously a shock to everyone the way it all kind of unfolded and um and the the infamous word pivoting you know in a direction that helps you stay stay afloat um so we all you know we did the the whole delivery um you know routine and we did 
ramen dad actually turned into a, a at home offering. So we do an at home ramen. So the noodles are packed and you, you get your broth and you cook everything at home. Um, so that's still that's still one of our offerings. So ramen daddy is just a, a a takeaway brand really and the canteen become the the sake and ramen bar um but the the whole you know um experience of you know trying to keep your team together and um making sure you know you you came out on the other side prosperous um definitely taught you a lot about your own resolve and um and also just helping everyone else through it you mentioned that uh, your cooking's changed quite a bit and there's a real focus on uh, the ingredient uh, these days. Tell us a little bit about the region and some of the producers that you connect with and champion on the menu. Yeah, I mean, Canberra's a little bit, it's a, it's a funny, um, like we're still growing and emerging, emerging at a, as a region. Um, so there's not a great deal of, of offering as far as proteins and um and poultries go around the district. Um, there's a small, you know, small offering that that comes to the markets, but not in the volumes that we would require. Um, so we just work with, you know, some of the the butcheries in Sydney, um, and we we get our seafood locally now that comes through, obviously Sydney, um, but on a daily basis, which is great. Um, working just with you know what what local produce producers we can for the um the volume of produce that we require and so the boathouse is a large restaurant um you know we have three private dining rooms and those private dining rooms can be either a combination of uh, private events or, or um, a restaurant offering so the the volume of food is quite staggering that we use for what I'd say is a medium-sized venue. Um, so a lot of our produce still comes from, um, you know, like the likes of Parisi in, in Sydney come down on a daily basis. Well, you've built an incredible brand and part of the sort of new wave as well with with Canteen. What do you love about what you do? Um, I guess it was like I was saying before, it's like every, every day is different. Um, there's always a new challenge um, and it's not so much the you know, the, the business challenges or the staffing challenges I'm talking about, it's just the, the, the food challenges like, um, you know, what, what's, what's next? What are we gonna be doing um, in six, 12, two years, five years time? Um, you know, we have, we have scope to, to broaden the, the offering here at the Boathouse. Um, so it's just kind of seeing where, where the market can, you know, we can fit into that market um, the, the bar proved that the position itself is quite popular uh, for a more casual offering. So maybe, you know, we have a look at doing something like that in the, in the near future. Well, John, it's, a, it's amazing to catch up and congratulations on the impact you've had on the dining landscape in Canberra and continue to. Um, please keep in touch and uh, look forward to catching up again soon. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for the chat, Huck. It was, um, yeah, really good to catch up with you again. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>